Y estamos de regreso en 8.8 en TK. 11 años trabajando en capacitar, informar y darle al mundo a conocer sobre la cultura hacker y de la ciberseguridad. Estamos contentos. Eh, pasó recién nuestra primera charla del keynote de eh, Chema Alonso, que está realmente increíble. Fue tan bueno que nos está llamando a la prensa para poder ver si se puede acceder a la charla rápidamente, para ver si se puede publicar algo. Eh, este tipo de artículos o este tipo de, de contenido, ustedes lo pueden encontrar en esta conferencia durante dos días porque ha llegado el momento central del año en ciberseguridad, en el mes de la ciberseguridad. 8.8, Security Conference está listo para continuar y eh, tenemos que recordar algunas cosas para que se preparen, antes de que todo se vuelva una locura. Lo primero es que esencialmente Yes Scramble de 11.50 hasta las 12 y de 1.10 hasta las 1.20 eh, van a realizar una demo virtual de Banking Demo Code Integrity para que se trasladen de inmediato al stand virtual de GC Scramble a esa hora para que se muevan, no antes. Eh, y eso lo pueden encontrar, ustedes van a encontrar un sidebar al lado de Pine donde ustedes pueden navegar muy amablemente y puede llegar hasta Sponsor y ahí va a encontrar los logos de cada uno y les va a llevar directamente a los stands eh, virtuales de cada uno de estos personajes que tienen mucho contenido también para que usted pueda eh, revisar y dar una vuelta mientras nosotros hacemos las tandas comerciales y aprovechamos también de eh, preparar lo que va a ser la siguiente conexión. Siguiente conexión que también, eh, recuerden que Karsperky a las 12.50 también se suma a estas actividades y eh, va a hacer preguntas con premio a través de, eh, eh, ¿cómo se llama esto? Del stand de eh, Karsperky. Los participantes deberán ver un video en su stand y responder una pregunta eh, y esa pregunta va a tener un tiempo limitado pero para, solamente para la gente que pudo ver el video. Así que estén atentos porque ese video se va a emitir a las 12.50, 12.51 y después desde las 2 de la tarde, eh, de las 2.10 a hasta las 2.20. Ahí hay premios. Karpersky tiene muchos premios para ustedes. Y, bueno, Palo Alto también va a hacer actividades a las 1.50 hasta las 2 de la tarde y también desde las 3.10 hasta las eh, 3.20 van a realizar un sorteo también en su stand. Así que atento con todo lo que está pasando alrededor del escenario central porque en esta especie de eh, concierto virtual estamos haciendo todo lo posible para que la experiencia sea lo más grata, lo más llevadera y podamos seguir adelante con esta conferencia que va a continuar ahora con una charla internacional nos vamos a conectar, que ya se encuentra en nuestra pantalla, eh, nuestro querido amigo David, eh, David Melnick, que está a mi siniestra, diestra, siniestra, querido director, don Manuel, él está ahí en, en la pantalla y estamos a la espera de que nos diga si nos conectamos ya con David Melnick, que es el director general de Wet Life Found, para que lo puedan ver. Ahí está, David, ¿cómo estás? ¿Me escuchas? Hello, I can hear audio. Hello. <laughs> you can hear me well. It's going in and out. I didn't hear anything. I lost you again. Okay. Eh, se está cortando mi comunicación con él, lamentablemente. Lo voy a presentar rápidamente, lo voy a dejar a él en el panel para que no perdamos más tiempo entonces, para que eh, tratemos de bajar al máximo eh, la continuidad de errores entre comunicación mía y de él. Los dejamos entonces con David Melnick para que se conecte de inmediato y puedan participar con él en esta charla majestuosa acá en 8.8 en TK. Hello everyone, I hope I can be heard okay. I apologize that I will be speaking in English. Mi español es muy mal, so I will dive in, assuming I can be heard. Um, my name is David Melnick, and I am going to tell you a story. And the story I will tell you is about the good, the bad, and the ugly of starting a security company. And I am going to give you the inside of the experience from starting a security company through the successful selling of that security company for over $60 million to Proofpoint. Uh, the journey was a four year journey. And uh, along that journey, there were a lot of uh, learning experiences and hopefully they will be of some value to you. So uh, assuming my audio is working and you're ready to take that journey with me and join me on this story, I'm going to dive in. Um, all right, with no further ado, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit about the company and the experience, but mostly focus on the moments of truth, the, the moments where we really had to change, adapt, pivot, 
uh, to find our way as a company to survive, to make it to that point where a public company proof point decided we were worth uh, over $60 million. So as far as the company starting, I was uh, a reasonably happy partner at Deloitte, a uh, national security and uh, privacy or cyber partner who was also running their privacy practice. And at the time in 2013, uh, Symantec was selling its global DLP licenses. Uh, and there was an, an interesting dilemma developing between privacy law and privacy requirements and the competing needs to achieve security. And what I mean is DLP was monitoring employees at a level we hadn't seen before. So we were, we were getting uh, intelligence. Uh, some people were monitoring literally keyboard uh, activity uh, and user activity at a level that was, uh, some people considered too much. And my idea started as a balancing of privacy and security using a remote browser. At the time, it was gonna be based on Oracle VirtualBox, a client-side technology to containerize and to pri make private the user's browsing experience from the monitoring of a corporate environment. Balancing security by saying, hey, since we're in this Oracle VirtualBox container, we're not gonna get any malware into the company. We're not gonna cause any problems. And so allowing the employee to privately browse the internet to do their personal email and other activities would be of relatively low risk. So the idea really came up while I was in a meeting with the chief information security officer of a public company named Amgen, a biopharmaceutical company. And we were sitting there, I was the partner, he was the CISO, and we were just talking about the dilemmas and the European regulatory problems he had with deploying DLP. And this idea came up that, well, wouldn't it be great if we could maintain privacy while also maintaining security? And he thought it was a great idea. And he said, if you build something like that, I would buy it. And so based on that conversation, I resigned a perfectly good partnership at Deloitte. I was it was viewed as an act of insanity. And uh, the resulting company that was created uh, ended up in that, after that leap, at the time of our acquisition, four years later, as a company with 22 employees, we had raised capital from various sources, including a tier one venture firm. We had raised three and a half million dollars in capital. We had 18 customers, a, a few million dollars in revenue, and we were by all measures a great, exciting early stage company. Um, but the story beneath this sort of profile that we had at the time of acquisition with big customer names on the right, you could see Amgen and Eli Lilly, Kaiser Permanente, a large healthcare company, the story beneath that was a little more interesting. Um, just on the flavor of the company, uh, I had really two key founding partners and I can't emphasize enough how important it was to get people on that journey with me. I had a wonderful chief technology officer who was innovative. I had a chief product officer who adapted and was great. But my core development team was really three Russians, you know, an amazing, you know, the, the power of one amazing developer is really unbelievable. And, you know, I've since I've run managed development teams with dozens and dozens of engineers at the same time. And, you know, having just several innovative, you know, one core team, but my product was really created, brought to life, and you know, it was those three Russians and one guy from Belarus that were really at the core of my development team. All my sales were contracted, you know, mercenary type sales folks. I had a virtual finance team. In fact, 
all of my employees were virtual employees. We were 100% remote, which is increasingly common now, but at the time was a, a, a wild risk. And frankly, it was a real complication when we tried to sell the company to convince Proofpoint that we were worth the kind of money they were spending because the idea of a virtual company didn't really seem like a real company. So let me just take a second on the journey we took uh, at a very high level, right? In 2013, we, I started this company, I resigned my partnership. I took all the money I could get my hands on. It was around a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000. And I spent that first year building a product. And it really wasn't much of a product when I look back. It, taking an open source platform like Oracle VirtualBox and trying to make it into a product was incredible. Trying to lock it down and make it so employees couldn't mess with their image so that it looked like commercial grade software so that it would be installed. This is a very heavy client to put onto someone's desk. But after about a year, we had built a product, we had tested it with Amgen, that CISO had made good on his commitment. He was the one person, that key one relationship. And in June of 2014, we signed the contract with Amgen. It was a big contract for us, hundreds of thousands of dollars. That contract, I think, was a $350,000 or more first year contract. And in that moment, we had created revenue and we had a client. I had $350,000 in the bank and I thought we were done. We were, we were on our way, right? We, we had some money and we went out trying to sell this product that we packaged up by November as Silo. Uh, it went to public release, if you build it and Nobody really came. I mean, I'll tell you the hard knock story to, to present the marketing story by June of 2015, a year later, we finally closed a second customer. And again, a lot of this was personal relationships. I went out on the road and sold to every CISO I knew. Um, by October of 2015, we had pivoted to a clientless version of this. Uh, I don't, I, I won't take you down the journey of how hard a client is, but let me just as one example, we tried to deploy VirtualBox to various countries for Amgen. They tried to move it to France and they tried to push through thousands of deployments as separate packages and took France offline for the company. Um, so a heavy client, terrible. Most companies wouldn't even look at a heavy client as a deployment because it's too much trouble. But by October of 2015, we had a clientless product. By 2016, we had 25,000 users on the product. We had Citibank talking to us. And in November of 2016, we finally closed a VC round of funding. We must have met with every tier one Silicon Valley investor who basically turned us away. We thought on the strength of having a public company client, we would be there, but no. <laughs> By January of 17, we were globally deployed in 40 countries. In May, after RSA, we closed Eli Lilly, another 60,000 user deal. Uh, and from there, things took off. And by the end of 2017, just four years later, Proofpoint announced our acquisition for $60 million. Today, Proofpoint has integrated our technology into their core platforms. We have millions and millions of users around the world and a revenue run rate that has gone up to approximately $100 million. So, uh, there are companies all over the world, major brands now using our technology for remote browsing um, in various forms. Uh, so uh, we've become the engine of Proofpoint's remote browsing capability that is built into their, their core technology. 
But let me back up and talk more about the moments of truth in starting and running a company. Um, the, the first one I want to talk about is our just complete and total failure to go to market. Uh, you know, layered against the same timeline, I'll just highlight that basically, short of Sony from the starting of the company and closing of Amgen in 2014, which we thought would then open the floodgates, we really just had two customers, Sony and Eli Lilly. And you could argue those were lucky in the way they came together. I mean, Eli Lilly, I can't underestimate the power of industry. You know, Eli Lilly trusted that if Amgen did it, it would make sense for them. So Eli Lilly took a leap because of that. But more importantly, Eli Lilly had a progressive CISO who had never worked in security. Any security person who we went to and said, let's give your employees a right to privacy in the workplace said, why would I want to do that? <laughs> you know, I want telemetry on everything they do. I don't want to give them privacy. The whole idea of granting employees a right to privacy for personal browsing, even in a contained secure space, seemed like a stupid idea to them. So we really failed on our whole story of balancing privacy and security, creating you know, a kinder, gentler world by giving employees a right to privacy while still maintaining security, that whole story just failed. And it took me way too long to realize that that story wasn't gonna work. I kept pitching that story long after every CISO had told me it didn't work. And that was one of my big failures and challenges was not pivoting earlier on that. I'll tell you my next failure, other than a complete failure in my go-to-market, cash. Oh my God. You know, it turns out that the wisdom I got from one of my mentors was, if you just don't run out of money, you win. That the trick really along the same timeline is, what, if you run out of cash, the story ends right? That is the only key measure of your success. If you maintain enough cash to keep operating, you ultimately will succeed in some form. In my journey, I thought I was putting a fortune into this company. My savings, everything I had, that $250,000, <clears> I spent it at a pace thinking this would all happen really easily, right? It was going to work. I burned through that money with consultants and building a product. I built a failed product, kept building. And if I hadn't closed Amgen, oh, there it was, it wasn't 350, it was 450. If I had not closed Amgen, which gave us an infusion of $450,000 of cash, we would, have, we would have failed. And in fact, when I got to the end of 2015, we were about out of money again. I'll give you the specifics of how close we came. But at the end of 2015, we had started to build a clientless version to get off Oracle VirtualBox, and we were close. But I had decided to shut down the company. I just didn't see a way to fund it. I, I couldn't think of any way to come up with the money. And my one of my teachers from school was having lunch with me a little old lady with barely any retirement. And she believed in me so much. She said, I'll write you a check for $25,000. You, you, I believe in you. More than I believed in myself at the time. I was beaten down. And at that point, I decided to try and go to everybody I knew. I went to my rich uncle and he said, no, I don't think so, David. I, I just don't believe this is going to work. I had to raise money from people I thought I would never take money from. My parents cut into their savings and retirement money and came up with money. I went to my, my wife's, my step-parents and asked them for money. It was an incredibly humbling event. 
I went to every friend I had, scraping up 10,000 here, 25,000 there. And by the time I was done, <clears throat> I had raised about $500,000. And now I was, for the first time, really scared. Because if I lost my parents' retirement money, for the first time, I, I was like, this is gonna be awful, right? What am I doing? Am I insane? And sure enough, less than a year later, I was out of money again. I was at the edge and now I was really panicked. And one of the most creative things we did in the company was I didn't realize the power of having that single client Amgen. And I went to them and I said, I got a great deal for you because I love you so much as one of my key clients, one of my only clients, I'll give you a great deal. If you prepay three years in advance, I'll give you an incredible discount. And it's really a gift to you to know that I'm not gonna raise my rates because things are blowing up for us. And I was able to get Amgen to do a three year continuation deal and raise $900,000 from them. And I think a lot of people don't realize that a customer, that you can use a customer to capitalize a company. When I couldn't raise money, I was failing. I had met with every tier one VC I could get an introduction to in Silicon Valley. And they had all said, I don't think this privacy idea is such a great idea. And I managed to raise that from Amgen. At that point, and I'll talk about this in a second, we had pivoted our story a little bit and we finally found a single VC. It was not a Silicon Valley VC. We found a VC in Denmark that was trying to sell a story that they were also working in Silicon Valley. So they had opened a little office there and they, believed in the privacy story because they were a European country and they understood GDPR and some of the privacy requirements. And we raised $3 million in VC funding at a decent valuation. So we had a roughly $10 million post money valuation. So a company now that's got like three clients, right? Um, that was pretty good, but some of that is because valuations are often done by whatever you raise, whatever the amount is, is gonna be about 25 to 30% of the equity of the company, right? So there's just a rule of thumb that if you raise 3 million, then you're probably a nine or $10 million company. So if you can get somebody to put in that money, if it's a million, then you're worth three or 4 million. If it's 3 million, then you're worth about 10 million. And we got them to raise $3 million at a $10 million post money valuation. And from there, things started to click into place. Eli Lilly came soon after. And the story in 2017 is really a fun story. But before I get there, I'll just highlight how desperate things were on the financial side. We had gotten to a point when I closed that friends and family round, I had literally $5,000 in the bank and I had a $20,000 a month burn with my contract employees. And if people would have probably known how close things were, I think everybody would have just abandoned ship. Um, again, by the time I closed that series A, I had $20,000 left in the bank and I was burning probably $80,000 a month at that point. We had ramped up and I was just lucky that that venture capital firm was somewhat inexperienced, frankly, and didn't really recheck the books because if they would have fully known how close to the edge I was, they probably would have renegotiated the deal or run away. By the time I got to July, 2017, when things were really starting to look good, I had, again, down to $22,000 in the bank. And now I was probably burning $150,000 a month. At this point, I had an option. So that $3 million of venture capital, 
it was really not three million. It was two point like one point seven five million of cash up front with an option at the venture capital firm's discretion to put in another one point two five. So I had to convince them that things were looking so great that they should definitely take that option and give me the additional money so that they could have more equity in what was going to be an amazing story. And it turned out to be an amazing story for them. That VC firm that put in $3 million cleared about six months later, about $20 million. So if you think about it, the return on investment for that 1.25 they put in, they, they did okay. Um, but where I want to go now, and I really am going to wrap up pretty soon and see if there's any questions pretty soon. But where I want to go now is the key pivot points in the company, because I think sometimes you get so caught up in the things you've built or the stories you've created that you're not willing to adapt or pivot and abandon those stories. And I would say to you that any entrepreneur that is successful goes through at least two or three pivots at a very fundamental level. For me, the first pivot was when I had abandoned the client side technology, the Oracle virtual box platform. We had spent at the time years, right? Two years almost building. And we had to recognize that no one was going to buy this, that the amount of intellectual property created in adapting open source like Oracle VirtualBox and trying to lock down an image, it was a pain in the butt to deploy and not valued. And it just wasn't working. And around this time, you know, for those of you technically know Docker and some platforms were blowing up that created the possibility that we could move this idea off-prem and virtualize browsing technology with completely cloud-based sort of implementations that essentially were mapping a user's browser experience without any plug-in, without anything, that we could take a browsing experience and essentially man in the middle of the browser and transform and so browser agnostic you know, my client side container was adapting and pre processing, cleansing any script, executing any script in a virtual container, and then delivering down just good old fashioned HTML to the client side with our script to manage any change events and to mirror change events up to our cloud based man in the middle to replay those against the server to react to any events that were server side as well as any changes and mirror those back down. That change in technology approach set the stage for all of our success, that adaptation on technology. But the second and maybe most painful pivot came really later when we gave up the privacy story. Now, my dirty little secret is that those Millions and millions of users out there now, that $100 million product line that I have going at Fortune 500 companies all around the planet, that still grants the end user a limited right to privacy in the workplace. It still achieves the privacy story, but I couldn't sell the privacy story. I had to sell a security story. Security officers who were my buyers weren't going to pay for privacy. If it was a byproduct use case, maybe, but they weren't buying privacy. They were buying security. They were buying that we were preventing malware from getting onto the endpoint, right? That was what they were buying, right? So we had to completely refocus the way we told the story. And it was heartbreaking for me because I wanted to change the world and grant users a right to privacy in the workplace. I wanted to deal with Big Brother and rebalance the security story to create a fine, a kinder, gentler sort of approach. But I had to let all that go. Finally, we cultivated 
you know, our story in the end as browser isolation, a remote browser story. We embraced where Gardner had gone with it. And that became our final story. The story of the proof point purchase, the story that took us to success. But some stories are subtler. When we were acquired, Proofpoint said, I, I can't have Russian developers building our security software. <laughs> the optics don't work. So we actually ended up having to relocate our software developers from Russia. I had to convince them to sign on board and move to one of the other countries. In this case, they, they, took, they chose the UK in order to close that deal. And I can talk more about the difficulties of M&A and all of the amazing, I could have done this whole talk just on the story of going through the merger and acquisition process of just going through Proofpoint. There were moments when that deal fell apart and came back. The ability to do that deal, that could be my whole story. And I'd be happy to talk more about the experience of trying to pitch and sell your company and how that happened. And it was an incredible story. And it's one thing when you're doing it as an outsider, but if the result of that story is my life's gonna change, right? I now don't have to work anymore. I now have millions of dollars, right? If the deal goes through, I win. If the deal doesn't go through, the company might collapse. That, that part's a whole different story. So I'll just sort of wrap up with kind of the changed company we became. You know, I'd say, you know, from an external perspective, and a lot of these changes we had to deal with didn't start from inside. They were external factors that shifted our story. And this is the luck part of a startup. You know, is your company the right company at the right time for the marketplace? And in the beginning, we weren't. Right? There was a product, Bromium, out there. There was a, a product that had splashed the market with isolation and had ruined everyone's perception of it, had made it seem like it was a terrible idea. And we had to overcome that. Gartner started to embrace isolation, and that was our first pivot point of external story. Um, the other one, which had been 15 years in the making, you know, was the GDPR guidance. That gave a real exciting punch in the arm to our privacy story. It was powerful. It helped us close Eli Lilly, but it wasn't enough to prevent me from pivoting. The final and probably the biggest story was really when Symantec decided to spend roughly $240 million to buy a little known remote browsing company called Fireglass. And when that event happened, everything changed. And I couldn't have anticipated that event. It still in hindsight looks like a terrible mistake for Symantec, a terrible overpayment. But the moment they did that, every competitor to Symantec said, I have to have a position in remote browsing to compete with the Fireglass platform that Symantec is integrating. It made us real. All of the competitors, Menlo Security, Authenticate, other players in the remote browsing experience, they were really all small companies. Menlo had raised a fair amount of capital, but we were all small. But when Symantec did that and bought Fireglass, all of a sudden, we had a buyer universe that you see at the bottom of the page that was incredible. And we brought in a boutique M&A firm and we had them package us up and take us out to all of the potential buyers out there to see if we could capitalize on the excitement around remote browsing that was taking, browser isolation that was happening because of Symantec's meeting. Now, the interesting story is Every one of those companies wanted to take a meeting, right? We had a, more than a dozen pitches to corp development teams at these big companies. And all of them were curious. They were all trying to learn what was happening, try to make sense of the Firegoss acquisition. But none of them bit. The only company 
that really went to acquisition with us was a company that we had been introduced to six months earlier. And this made all the difference. One of my mentors and advisors, knowing that if you want to exit a company a year from now, that you have to build trust and relationship with potential acquirers early, start strategic conversations with them, go to market conversations, partnership conversations. And we had done that with Proofpoint. I had gotten an introduction to the CEO. We had started to talk about the technology at a deep level inside their advanced technology group. And they were a good company. We got very lucky. They made and kept the promises they had to us. And when we had this fire glass event take place, they were the one that were serious, that took it all the way. We had some other people in the hunt, but they were the ones that did it, not just because they saw remote browsing as important, but because they had had a trust level with us from six months of due diligence, of conversation. And that made the difference. There's a lot more to that story of how we closed that deal. But that's sort of the outline. And I'll kind of stop there and shift gears to see if there's any questions worth talking about. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks to you, uh, David. Uh, first question, um, what kind of browser do you prefer? What kind of browser? Yeah. So it was interesting because, you know, I don't prefer any browser, but I live in a world where you know what the deployments are at the customers that you work with. So we lived in a world where most of our customers had very small Mac deployments and they had very large PC deployments. And so IE was the dominant browser when we started. Edge, later, it's still IE, because they're all behind on technology. At the big companies, that changed over the years while we were there, and Google started to become the most dominantly used browser. On Mac deployments, of course, it was Safari. For me, what was important was I had to do translation in the cloud because we had a Chromium instance in the cloud. So all of the browsing we ran, and I guess that would be my preference from a technical perspective, ultimately headless Chromium. We were using Chromium to do all of the browsing from our point of interception to the end websites. But we had to then convert it into a format and essentially change some of the HTML and change what we sent back uh, spoofing effectively the browsers that were all on the endpoints. So we were spoofing to accommodate IE and Chrome and Safari. I don't know if that answers the question, but. <laughs> okay. What is the best moment to start looking for investors in, in, a, in, a, in a, a very little enterprise? What is the best moment to the enterprise? So. It's interesting because I would say that a CEO's job is 100% of the time to be always raising money, right? <laughs> you are always hunting for cash. From the moment you start till the day you exit, you are in a constant search for money. And so on a practical level, you know, the money is different when you are pre-product. The money is different when you have a product, but you're pre-market. And the money is different when you are in market, right? You, when, you are, when you have a half dozen customers and you have proved out the product, then the kind of money you're raising is money to ramp the business up and go to market, right? So that's a bigger raise. But you're looking for money early and the money rounds have changed. It, when I started a series A round, right? You would have a pre-seed, maybe a seed round and then a series A. And a series A was three to five million dollars. And then once you were, and that was, I have a product, but I'm just testing the market. I haven't got my pitch yet. 
And then when you, a series B would be going to market, right? I am now ready. I need to ramp up sales and marketing. And that might be a $20 million round. But today, today, a seed or pre-seed round can be three to $5 million. The money has gotten bigger. So I would say from day one, you are looking to capital. The question is, where are you looking to capital? Day one, you might not be looking for a tier one VC, right? You, you're looking for angel investors. You're looking to do, instead of an equity-based round, a note, a convertible capped note uh, or safe note, right? I'll pause there because that's probably more than you. I want to get more questions in if there are. <laughs> the last one. Uh, what is the key to dealing with the rapid advance of technology? So that's interesting because, you know, you, the, we, as you saw in some of our pivots, right, the technology was changing on us fast and it was so fundamental to us because when I started, we didn't have the Docker and management platforms available on AWS that made possible what our product actually was. Right? We could not have done what we did when we started. Right? When we started, the technology wasn't there. And if we weren't paying attention, if we weren't looking at the advances in the Kubernetes platform AWS began offering and the Docker capability and what it could do so that it became possible to do a completely cloud-based remote browser on the fly, dynamically provisioned, right? That, so, Staying on the edge of technology was absolutely essential for us because it led us to pivot our product into something brand new. But it, it was hard to do because you get invested in your product, right? You've, I've spent a million dollars and two years of my life building something on Oracle VirtualBox. Oh my God, am I going to start over? So understanding the leaps in technology and the, the changes in the frameworks, the availability of services, the capabilities out there, you know, is, was absolutely essential. But making a hard decision about when that advancement of technology is sufficient so that you need to really fundamentally rethink your approach, you know, that's tough, right? And that comes down to the same things we think about around technical debt. And I, I'm a fierce believer in buying down technical debt and sometimes replatforming, and you know that I, I, I think that's essential. Um, so, and it and it's a cost, and it's a risk. But um, you know, you know, you got to make good decisions, and you hopefully have a CTO where you're good enough to know what's real and what's not real, what's important and what's not important, what fundamentally changes your use case and what doesn't. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, for your knowledge, uh, for talking about this with us. Uh, I'm very, very glad with your presence today. So very, very, very thank you to you. I appreciate everyone willing to take a moment and hear a story that's not just a technology story, right? I mean, because I think it's really important for us to all think about, you know, we're building this great technology. You know, what do we do to bring it to the market, to get people to use it, to monetize it? How do we get rewarded for our work? How do we change the lives of people? And ultimately, it's company building at the end of the day that really gives the opportunity to bring technology and to change the world, right? So, and there's not really a lot of classes on how do you build a, you know, how do you do that? <laughs> Right, so I appreciate your willingness to hear this story, and thank you very much. Thank you. Bueno, y despedimos a David. Agradecemos su tiempo. Eh, estamos muy contentos, pero nos va pillando el, el, la máquina. Tenemos tantos, tantas, tantas, tantas charlas y contenido que darle a ustedes hoy día. Y les recuerdo que son eh, exactamente las eh, 11.56. Recuerden que ahora parte desde las 11.50 hasta las 12 se van al stand de Jesus Scramble y eh, pueden participar en la demo virtual de Banking Demo Code Integrity que está activa desde este momento. El size bar de al lado van a encontrar patrocinadores. Ahí se van derechamente al stand virtual eh, de Jesus Scramble. Participen de inmediato que está esta demo virtual Banking Demo Code y hay mucho más material. De eso una vuelta porque hay hartos minutos ahora puede dejar andando la transmisión mientras con una ventana al lado en el browser usted navega el contenido que tienen para, nos, para ustedes nuestros patrocinadores que se toman el aire en este momento en esta onceava versión de la 8.8 
Computer Security Conference. Estamos muy contentos, estamos de fiesta. Los dos días más importantes de la ciberseguridad son ahora y nos vamos a tomar un pequeño respiro para preparar nuestra siguiente charla y volvemos de inmediato acá en Enteca. We'll be right back. 